So I'll share a secret with everybody. Every era of Yom Kippur, I would come into this room from my office, which is right through those doors, or was right through those doors, and spend some time alone here. I would stand right around here on the stage, on this bima, and I would look around the room. And I would say to myself, so-and-so used to sit over there, and they're no longer here with us. They won't be here this year for Kol Nidre. And I would think about a family that sat over there and is experiencing difficulty. And of course, I would look to other areas and rejoice over the fact that many families had welcomed new children over the course of the year. And I would continue to sort of take stock of how different our community looked on the eve of that Kol Nidre as opposed to the eve of the previous one. For me, and I'm sure it's the same for many of you, navigation of the sanctuary was based on where people sat, which families sat near each other, who was still here and who was not. These walls brought together three different congregations and ultimately combined them into one united synagogue. The seats of the sanctuary cradled generations of families, grandparents, parents, and their children who came to pray here, to cry here, and to rejoice here. These walls have absorbed the sounds of our prayers and the wisdom of our Torah. This room has been the setting where we've offered thanksgiving for our greatest triumphs and called out to God in troubled times. We have expressed our greatest hopes and dreams here. Echoing off the walls of this holy chamber is the lifetime of our community, the multi-generational and diverse sounds that can only be created by a community like ours. Who can forget, as we already heard, Cantor Dean's beautifully haunting and inspiring Kol Nidre? And of course, who could not forget, who could forget the less inspiring Yom Kippur Musaf fire alarm? <laughs> and I would just like to put out there that we are still looking for the culprit who started that fire in a garbage bag in the Friedman Hall kitchen. How many times have we heard Reverend Radinsky telling couples that the ketubah expresses the promises of husband to wife and the, and the husband promises everything and the wife promises nothing. I hope you both keep your promises. <laughs> so many of us have seen our kids graduate UOS, GMS, and RMBA right here. And how many hundreds and hundreds of lollipops have been distributed up here, reminding our kids that Torah, shul, and community are the sweetest treats they will ever get. This room was our home and its sanctity derived from how we used it. According to the Ramban and Nachmanides, a synagogue assumes holiness because of the mitzvot that are done in it. This morning, despite the bare walls and concrete floor, despite the missing ark curtain and our makeshift mechitza, this room is full of kedusha, is full of holiness. It is full of holiness as we have returned to pray and to gather as a community to remember all of the mitzvot, all of the Torah and tefillah and chesed that were done here and inspired from here. Rabbi Salavechik notes that there's a difference between the honor due to a, the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, and the honor due to a synagogue. In explaining the more lenient rules of a synagogue, Rabbi Salavechik quotes the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, where the sage Rab says, Ki veto ma veto a kapandria kapitinish, min al lo kapitinish, af beta kaneset kapandria uda asur, min al shari. The synagogue, the Gemara says, is like one's home. Just as one objects to a person using one's home as a shortcut, but does not mind when one wears shoes in their home, so too in the case of a synagogue. A shortcut is prohibited while wearing shoes is permitted. The synagogue is compared to a home, and so things normally permitted in one's home 
are also permitted in the synagogue. Rabbi Salavajic explains the incredible upshot of this. There are times when God invites people to his house, to the Beit HaMikdash. In that case, we are God's guest. Yet there are times when God descends, answers our prayers, and rests his glory in our house. In this case, we are the master of the house, and God is the guest. And so the rules of what is proper honor is based on the expectations of the master of the house. And for decades, this was our house. And we invited God to descend from his lofty heights to hear and answer our prayers. We made it our home, a home worthy of inviting God. And now it is time to say goodbye. And maybe some of us are feeling anxious about what comes next. If so, then we are in good company. In the time of the prophet Haggai, those who returned from Babel to build the second temple were hesitant and nervous. Would the second temple measure up to the first? Certainly it would not have the similar grandeur and beauty. And so the prophet Haggai comforts them and says, Gadol yihyeh kevod habayet hazeh ha'acharon min harishon amar Hashem tzibahot. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former one, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will grant prosperity, declares the Lord of hosts. This prophecy for us becomes a challenge. The degree to which our next house will be greater than this one depends on us, on the mitzvot we do in that place. On the Torah we will learn in that place, and in the chesed that will be inspired from it. The Gemara we study compares a shul to a house. This was our house. It no longer is. But we are still a family. A family poised to build a new house that, please God, will be greater than the one that came before it. And a place from where attain shalom nuhum Hashem tzibahot. A place from where the Lord of hosts will grant us prosperity and peace. Thank you all for coming today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.